This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. They stole little Bridget for seven years long. When she came down again, her friends were all gone. They were the fairies. When the 19th century Anglo-Irish poet Richard Allingham wrote The Fairies, he was replicating a belief about supernatural figures who steal children that stretch back to ancient Persian myths that date from 3000 BC. Demon figures and fairies have undergone a series of transformations, but what remains constant is their supernatural power and their association with the concerns of birth, death and loss. In what way have fairies changed in guise and purpose throughout history? How did ancient fairy law sit with the Christianity of the Middle Ages? How were fairies appropriated for the purposes of 16th century witchcraft trials? And why did fairies beguile so many Victorian artists and writers? With me to discuss fairies are Juliet Wood, Associate Lecturer in the Department of Welsh at Cardiff University, Diane Perkis, Fellow and Tutor of English at Keble College, Oxford, and Nicola Bone, Lecturer in Victorian Studies at Birkbeck College, University of London. Juliet Wood... What are fairies historically and what have they been associated with? Well, they're supernatural beings who inhabit a space, both conceptual and physical, between gods and men. And they are specifically supernatural beings and they are associated with places. They have their own world, which parallels the human world, but they're also associated with natural places, forests, streams, and with the works of man, with bridges and orchards. They love apple trees, with the dairy and with the hearth. So you get a group of beings who are not really gods, but have a supernatural nature which parallels our own, and that's the really important thing. They're very ancient. We know them from India, or relatively similar beings from India, things like the Nagas, who could marry human beings, and many royal Indian families have a Nagas as their ancestor or ancestress. We know them from Persia, where they get to be much darker. So we're actually talking about a tradition which goes back several thousand years and which is very, very widely distributed through India, the Near East, and Europe. And this is what the, this is what the fairies are. You say this other world is bridges and in dairies and in the hearth and at the bottom of gardens and so on. So it, it's another world, but it's on our world. Yes, I think the best way probably is to think of it as another dimension. It's almost as if they inhabit the same space, but they inhabit it in a different dimension because, of course, the fairies are spiritual. They're not physical. So we kind of have to think of them as very, very close to us and therefore very easy for them to interact with us. But they're not us. And they're not gods. Very often they're called demigods, but the fairies are what the fairies are. They're a distinct class of supernatural being. But the thing with the fairies is they could appear like us. We can easily mistake a fairy for a human being. It's only the way the fairy acts that suddenly gives him or her away, and we realize this is not a human. Diane uh, Perkis, the Persian fairy demon Lamashtu was appropriated by the Jews and became the Hebrew demoness Lilith. Can you tell us about those two and what was important there? Yeah, the idea is that the Hebrews learned about Lamashtu during the Babylonian captivity. She is a scary fairy because she represents something that's often intrinsic to fairies. She's stuck at a certain point in life. Fairies often represent a part of mortal life that you kind of can't move on from the way a human being would. And she is stuck at the stage of a woman's life where her desperate need is to have a child and to have a live child. But she can't do it. And the reason is because when she tries to suckle her children, they die. She's so poisonous that her children just die at her breast and wither up. And that gives her a longing to steal other women's children. And so the menace that she represents and that her Hebrew avatar, Lilith, represents is a menace to the newly born child. She comes in the night and she puts the child to her breast and the child suckles her poison and dies. It's actually said that if the child is restless at the mother's breast, it's because it sort of formed an unnatural addiction to the poisonous breast of Lamashtu or Lilith. So if, if your child doesn't breastfeed well, it's a sign that it's in danger. And this is to do with, I think, the mother's terrible fear of the death of the child, but also these creatures represent perhaps the negative feelings that a mother can have about a child the fear that you're not a good enough mother the fear that you're not feeding your child enough the fear that you're somehow not worthy of your perfect newly born child 
And those fears are very difficult to talk about because they're mixed with hatred and aggression. So these stories provide an outlet for that bundle of almost inexpressible maternal hatreds and angers and dreads. Nicola Byrne, can you tell us about the Roman take on this and how they appeared in Ovid's stories, these creatures? Well, I think the fact that we retrospectively call all these beings fairies says something important about how cultures use the materials that they find and borrow from each other and rewrite them. So the beings that you get in Ovid's metamorphoses, the dryads and naiads, the well spirits and wood spirits, appear in later forms, reworked again as pagan gods or and then later and still as fairies. And it's as if we are retrospectively creating a tradition out of a series of writings, tracing continuities, which then come in the Renaissance and later to be called fairies. So I think one of the interesting things is the way that these continuities of these beings who are between our world and the world of the gods yeah. reappear <clears throat> again and again in mythological settings and in writings that we look to for myths. Are they malign beings? Are they benign beings? I mean, can you give us a rough idea before we move on? They have a dual nature, sometimes benign and sometimes malign. In that sense, they're like nature, and the spirits like naiads and dryads are always associated with nature and the propitiation of nature, which is, of course, the world that we live in as humans. So sometimes spirits are our friends, and sometimes they work against us. If we can localise it a little to this country, well, the British, where are these creatures in pre-Christian and early Christian Britain? They are part of a, a whole strata of supernatural beliefs and deities who gradually become incorporated in the, the spiritual world of medieval Christianity, passing from sort of divine status as pagan gods into the panoply of spirits who may be of the devil's party, but are certainly part of the belief systems of medieval Christianity. Can we disentangle that for a moment, Julie, before we go on, because we come to the Anglo-Saxon, the 10th century Exeter book. Now we have the spiritual values of a different order coming in with Christianity, and we have the pagan belief system, and we have the fairies. So we've got to, if we're keeping on track with these fairies, we've got to know where they are in the 10th century. We do. And the 10th century is a very interesting period because at that time, Christianity is very elastic. And I think we tend to think part of these things were Christian and part of these things were pagan. But for the people who were operating, they were simply operating in a powerful spiritual world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the fairies or the elves, which would have been the name the Anglo-Saxons gave them. The elf shot. The mm -hmm. elf shot were, pa were what part the of elf this. Great. Well, in the Exeter book, there are several charms, and one of them is a charm against elf shot. And elf shot was basically a shot fired by a fairy and it caused you a sudden stitch there's a charm an against arrow, it really. an, an arrow, mm. um, a, a little sort of bow and arrow and the arrow would hit you, you wouldn't see it but you'd feel it as a sudden stitch but also more serious things um, strokes <coughs> were thought to come from elf shot mm. and the most fascinating charm is the one against elf adult, against elf sickness which was the nightmare but not just a bad dream, the sense of being completely helpless in sleep mm. and the feeling that somehow the elf had ridden you, that, that you, you were taken out of yourself. I and mean, it's a very unpleasant experience. So here were all of these physical things. And the interesting thing, they were treated by charms, which referred to the elf, by Christian prayer and by medicine. Mm -hmm. And the idea is you used all three. So these fairies were not, oh, these horrible pagan things that we have to Christianize. But at this point, this very, very powerful supernatural beings who are used um, along with other kinds of medicine to treat human beings. And again, always, the idea is the fairies and the humans or the elves and the humans parallel one another. And in part, the way we behave towards them is the way they behave towards us. Mm -hmm. They are dual-natured, but they're also curiously neutral in the way nature is neutral. And if we can control 
what happens, then we can get the upper hand. Diane, can I ask you, let's move, we've moved into the medieval period now, we find the idea of the changeling emerging. Now, it's been around for a while, but let's just discuss the notion of changeling in this particular historical context. Can you tell our listeners about the changeling beliefs and how it was so closely riveted to the notion of fairies? Well, a changeling is a fairy child that's been substituted for a human child. What happens is you get up in the morning and your baby's gone and it's been replaced by a fairy baby. Does the fairy baby look like your baby? The fairy baby can look exactly like your baby, but there are various ways that you can detect the imposter. You can subject the changeling to different kinds of tests. Um, one of the classic ones in folklore is to boil water in an eggshell. The changeling will find it irresistible to comment on the oddity of your proceeding and thus reveal itself by speaking um, in a way that only an adult could normally speak. There are other kinds of remedies that, that you can use if, if you've got a changeling baby, which, you know, which I'd like to, a theme I'd like to return to. But this is again about this fairy desire for mortal babies. Fairies long for human babies and they take them away and substitute one of their own babies. Um, and there's Why a wonderful do fairies want human babies? Because they can't have babies very easily. The rationalisation is later. But I think these stories... But if they're swapping a fairy baby for a human baby, they're not getting any more human babies, are because they? Because it's not really a fairy baby. It's a sort of imposter. It's actually a really old fairy that just happens to be small. All oh, right. It's not actually an infant. So what you're getting instead of youth and promise and newness and spring is old age um, and wizardness and knowledge. And um, it's the fairies who want the youth and the mm. promise. Yes, I mean, the this fairies is, this is the fairy the desire. The promise. Because, yeah. of course, they're, in a sense, trapped in the immortality. Yeah, they're, they're stuck at a certain state of life. Stuck. This characteristic of so fairies. They, they desire things that the human that humans have. In in a sense, they kind of desire our mortality. Yeah, um, and they they steal these babies um, and young young men and women as well. They never steal old people. It has and to be. They steal change. They do almost. They do. But at this, we we mm. began to get we began to have accounts here. We mm. begin mm. to have accounts at this period of meetings between humans mm. and fairies, don't yeah. we? That's right. I mean, the, the key thing with changelings is that they provide um, a, a way of talking about encounters between the fairy and the human world. One key factor here that we should really mention and probably should have mentioned um, at an earlier stage because it's a part of very ancient Celtic myth mythology is that fairies are a special class of dead persons. Um, in, in Celtic tradition, they're not in Anglo-Saxon tradition as far as we know. The fairies are actually dead people who are cut off before their time. So if you die in battle or if you're a woman who dies in childbirth or if you're a baby that dies before you're christened, that's the category of dead people from whom fairies are drawn. So one way of understanding the changeling is that your baby's dead, died, been replaced with death, um, or with a kind of dead person. Um, the, the changeling myth involves various ways of more or less torturing the changeling in order to induce the fairies to come and take it back and bring back your baby. And people apparently did things like sitting the alleged changeling on the fire um, or more moderately leaving the, the changeling somewhere like a forest for the time it took a candle to burn down and the fairies were then supposed to come and return your real baby. Now obviously you don't need Sigmund Freud to see that these are very hostile ways of treating your baby. They're tantamount to infanticide. They may actually have been a sanctioned form of infanticide. There, there were, there are, there, there were the some fairies. accounts yeah. where clearly they put babies who were deformed in some way and these babies died and it was justified that oh, well, these, were, these were changelings. Yes, that's right. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But I think there's, there's a way of seeing all kinds of relationships between humans and fairies as alibis for other things. So for ex um, I always think that the very persistent myth of the lost time in the fairy hill, mm. where you're captured by the fairies on a dark night and taken away to fairyland, you think it's for a night you spend there feasting and dancing, and, and in fact you come back after seven years. That provides an alibi for all sorts of convenient disappearances. There are jokey versions of this, but particularly in Irish, that people sort of say, no, no, I wasn't drunk last night, I was taken away by the fairies, and this is regarded as quite hilarious. But also the, the, the dead woman, the idea of the, the fairies being the dead, you get the story quite commonly in Wales and in Scotland and Ireland, that a man will see his wife among the fairies, mm -hmm. his wife who has supposedly died, and will actually get her back, mm -hmm. and will then have children, and these children are called the sons of the dead woman, mm -hmm. and they have powers of themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a... It, Again, it's a way of talking about marriage, human relationships, mm -hmm. the relationship with children. Very, very common things. This isn't cosmology. This isn't creating the world. These are human lives. It begins to be drawn into 
if we're sticking to our country for a while, which we are for a little while, actually. We begin to draw into our literature. Chaucer, uh, can you give us um, Chaucer's um, attitude towards inclusion of uh, fairies in... Uh, well, fairy, uh, Chaucer writes about fairies in, in several of his works. For example, in the tale of Sir Potopus, he actually parodies French romances mm -hmm. of the fairies um, mm -hmm. and holds them up at, at, to, to ridicule the, the um, courtly stories of the, the fairies in the forest of Brasiliand in, um, in Brittany. But in the Wife of Bath prologue in the Canterbury Tales, she talks about the fairies as something that people used to believe in, mm -hmm. but now the fairy belief is disappearing and all the fairies have left. And that's, that's the first instance we know of, of the start of a very long tradition in which people are constantly lamenting the fact that the fairy belief is something that people used to have when the world was young, when people were more innocent, and that it's now gone and the fairies have left and all the magic has gone from the, from the countryside. And that's a theme that gets repeated time and time again. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I think you could see the whole fairy tradition as a, as a metaphor for a, a worldview or for a past that's a lost and gone forever. And yeah. a magical thing. How did they, uh, Dan Pegasus, how did they, the fairies, as it were, elide with or transfer into witches well, in about the 16th century? Well, in Scotland, um, we have lots of confessions from people, women accused of witchcraft, that mention fairies. And one of the reasons for this is that um, if you wanted to set yourself up as what was called a cunning woman, a white witch, you could claim that your power derived from your contact with the fairies. Now, a white witch would do things like curing minor illnesses, finding lost property, being able to locate buried treasure, um, all of which are skills that the fairies can confer on you. And one can see that what happened in these witchcraft confessions is that when asked pressing questions by interrogators, the Scottish witches in question would come up with whatever story they'd been telling their clients for the last 20 years. So one of them, a witch called Bessie Dunlop, explains how she exchanges her baby for the power to see and know given to her by the Queen of the Fairies. The Queen of the Fairies takes the baby and she takes the power. Um, and this would be a, a kind of self-advertisement. There's, there's another witch in Orkney called Elspeth Reich, um, who doesn't lose a baby but instead agrees to have sex with a fairy lord um, who's actually her dead cousin who's been killed in a recent battle and who comes to her for three nights running and in exchange gives her the power to tell who the father of unborn children is, which is obviously a socially pretty dangerous power to have um, and which she immediately and very tactlessly uses to tell another relative of her family that, that the baby she's carrying isn't her husband's. Um, so one can see how these people may have become unpopular enough to have they been on to witchcraft. They take over the fairy medicine as well. I yeah. mean, elf shot becomes associated with witches and cunning women. And yeah, exactly. um, there's a, um, a very interesting um, picture of a man holding his foot with an arrow through it. And next to him is a woman who's clearly a witch mm -hmm. who's got the bow. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, the man can't see her. I mean, they, she seems to be invisible to him. So you get very much the idea of the elf and the elf shot mm -hmm. that you could never see the person who shot you, transferred to the witch. And it's a very visual, dra dramatic transfer. And this is what was happening at this period, is mm -hmm. that you get um, a formalization of this and a demonization of this. Mm -hmm. And the demonization goes straight through, to the, straight through to the 18th century. Nicola, at the same time as the witchcraft affairs, it's becoming nice and complicated now because the literary persons, as you intimated with Chaucer, in fact you stated mm -hmm. with Chaucer, are taking this up for their own purposes. And we have a great burgeoning now, don't we? We have... We have we have Spencer, we have Midsummer Night's Dream, Shakespeare, we have Drayton, uh, and we have the idea of the miniaturisation of fairies. So the, the, the literary uh, men, and it is all men that I can, you can probably think of. It is women all men, actually, yes. are, ta are taking this up very, very strongly and using it uh, uh, very, in very subtle and uh, engrossing ways. Okay. And in very different ways. The, the, the folk traditions that we've been talking about um, up to now are mainly associated with the um, with the countryside and often with the domestic with domesticity 
or farming. But these literary representations of fairies, they're urban and courtly. Mm. And they are imagining... Again, it's another... It's, it's, it's a world... It's another parallel world. But mm. it's a parallel world to the royal court mm. that writers such as Shakespeare and Drayton, though they weren't part of, they were thinking about and looking mm. at. Mm. So they take up the, the court of Oberon and Titania. It becomes a magical dream world of the... Tudor and Stuart courts that formed had so much power in in the at, at this time and in the right, lives of these writers. Have you have you, any, have you a theory about why so many of them should be so interested in it? The courts themselves seemed to be from the outside and were anxious to be seen as places of of, of glamour and magic. Mm. So in that sense, it's natural to. It's a natural step to move from the metaphor of a fairy queen to um, a, a, a poem about a fairy queen, a, a, who, a queen who is actually a fairy. Queen Elizabeth I liked to be compared to the queen of the fairy queen. She Jews. did. She Why did. is that? Well, it was a power symbol for her. Um, and it allowed her, and, and particularly her poets, to see her in this world, which is very multi-layered, because the world of the Fairy Queen was England. Uh, possibly it was Ireland, which she was conquering, which was giving her so much problem. But also it was empire. Um, and I think that's the really important one, is that she was Gloriana, queen of an empire. Mm. Um, and, of course, here was the empire of the fairies that she, she could have. And then, of course, you can nuance the fairies politically. Mm. But I think that the, the draw initially is that here is something which can be nuanced, which kind of aren't Catholic saints or Catholic angels to begin with. In the 18th century, we begin to get strong visualizations of fairies and the revival of Shakespeare prompted someone to uh, artist to illustrate it and Fuseli did illustration of uh, Fuseli did illustration of Midsummer Night's Dream can you take it on from there yes the um, end of the at the end of the 18th century there's a big project to illustrate Shakespeare's plays the first of, of many and some of the most popular images from popular paintings from the Boydell Shakespeare Gallery were Fuseli's pictures for Midsummer Night's Dream, Titania on Bottom and The Awakening of Titania. And these are really significant because in all of the representations, all of the accounts of the fairies we have before, there are hardly any images of what fairies look like. There are descriptions of fairies varying wild, wildly. But it's at this time, at the end of the 18th century, when our picture of what fairies look like, diminutive and with insect wings, that finally takes shape. And that's the image of the fairy that's been passed on to us. Juliet, how should the, how should the 18th century interest in fairies be interpreted, do you think? Well, again, you get a lot of things coming together. Uh, you get an interest in insects, and you get an interest in nature, and I think this helps with the insect wings. And the development of scientific and the development of scientific so you could, see, you could, actually, you could yeah. see it. Yeah. And, of course, a lot more species were being discovered. Mm. So, I mean, there's a scientific element of, to this as well. Uh, there's an interest in the marvellous. There's a reaction to science as well, which sort of um, brings fairies to, to the fore. People were starting to say, ah... If fairies exist, and exist in a particular place, this is proof of a spiritual world, a counter to, to, to the Enlightenment. So you get this counter-Enlightenment thing as well. And, of course, you also get um, the rise of urban culture. And here's where you get the demand for fairy pictures uh, and the revival of Shakespeare's plays and the beginning of these wonderful sort of pantomimes where fairies were brought in. You get the rise of ballet as well. I, mean, that I think all enormous. of this actually happens in the 19th it, rather it than the crosses 18th century. It, it crosses over. Over, but this, is, this, this starts it. And certainly the, the, certainly the interest in science um, and certainly the reaction against science. Well, what, let's talk about the sexual aspect of fairies, which comes in at around this time too more strongly. They seem to be both seductive and innocent. Uh, they have sexual allure and they're untouchable. Where's that going down? 
Well, I mean, if we look at the, um, something that Juliet just touched on, um, the Victorian Music Hall Ferry, um, one of the associations for fairies for a Victorian gentleman wouldn't just be cute, childlike winged figures, but also scantily clad girls in muslin frocks sitting on clouds showing an awful lot of leg in what were called extravaganzas or spectacles, um, in which Victorian gentlemen could sort of sit in the, the, the stalls and look and up look the dresses the of these really... <laughs> These really scantily clad girls, and that they're highly sexualized, and that borrows from the sexuality of the nymph figures and the fairy queen figures that but we've been discussing. But the sexuality was there in the stories as well. Yeah, because a lot of the originally. stories are about marriages uh, yeah. or about liaisons between human beings and fairies, which are always very fraught. Yeah, it's not invented um, it's by not, the Victorians, no, no it, doubt. But it's given this was there. new but commercial it's form of it, expression. It's certainly given this commercial form, and it's yeah. certainly made um, the sexuality in the stories was something that could be resolved. The sexuality in Victoria period was simply something that could be sold and was very widely. Uh, we know the Victorian uh, enormous, uh, enormous number of people were writing about fairies, illustrating fairies. Is, <coughs> excuse me, is Peter Pan, Diane Perkins, is, is that some apotheosis? I know it's 1902, but is that some apotheosis of the 19th century Victorian obsession? Absolutely. I think one of the reasons that the fairy is less current for us is Peter Pan because it brings to a kind of summation everything that the Victorians do with fairies. And also Barry was Scottish and he knew a lot of Scottish folklore. There's an enormous amount of fairy folklore in Peter Pan. Well, Put a lot of kirk lot together. Mm. Yeah, it? but right I, but I think as as well that that Barry's mother was Scottish and told him stories, yeah. and he, he says this himself. And what Peter Pan's really about is dead children. Mm. Um, I mean, every Wendy house is a kind of tomb, really. Um, th there's this intriguing moment where Wendy's thought to be dead, and they build a house around her, and and, and then she sort of gets better. Um, what's fascinating about um, Peter Pan is that he's rather like um, an ancient Persian demon called Kubu, um, who's a lost child, a child that never gets named, and therefore longs for other children as companions. That's exactly what happens to Peter, particularly in early versions of the story, The Little White Bird and Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens. And this is kind of autobiographical, because Barry had a brother who died when he was still a child. And Barry always envied this little boy, um, because he was his mother's favourite, and his mother never ceased to mourn um, for, for Barry's dead brother. And really, the only way not to grow up to be Peter Pan is to be a dead child. And, and this is sort of implicit in the Peter Pan legend. Um, the Peter Pan and his followers are babies who fell out of their perambulators um, and got lost in They're Kensington Gardens. They're, They're changing. Changing. Yes, exactly. And, sorry, Nicholas. Isn't, but the climactic moment of Peter Pan on stage, the, the thing that everybody remembers is Tinkerbell being brought back to life yeah. when Peter Pan comes forward onto the front of the stage and says, quick, say that you believe to the children. The children in the audience are required to clap in order to show that they believe in fairies. And I think the question is, who are they clapping for? Who are they believing for? I don't think that they are being asked to believe for themselves. They're being asked to believe for Peter. Yeah. No, they're being adults. asked for well, adults. For, adults, yeah. for <laughs> their <laughs> parents <laughs> who can't, can no longer believe in fairies. And it's, it's the idea, again, of... The, this f of childhood as a fairyland that we adults have lost mm -hmm. that's being dramatized very painfully mm -hmm. and memorably in this in this amazing theat theatrical moment well i'm sorry we didn't get onto the cottingley fairies or the irish folklore commission which discovered fairies in ireland way into uh, middle and beyond the middle of the last century but thank you all very much thank you julie wood diane Perkis and Nicola Bone. Next week we'll be talking about J.S. Mill, the 19th century philosopher and author of On Liberty. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.